Okay. I am the author of Aging Powerfully, my book that is part memoir that takes you back in, in such a way that it makes a little bit more clear why I have such a fiery determination to make a difference in people's lives because I had a struggle for decades and decades with an eating disorder and what it did to me, my self-esteem, my self-confidence in spite of the fact that I acted and looked like I had it all together. It was devastating and I found the resolution to that in what I'm doing now and that is a, a lifestyle as medicine uh, adoption of pillars, specific pillars of health that can make all the difference with, I'll just say balancing our body. And sometimes the things that we do to hurt it are because we're out of balance. And when we get back in balance, we feel better. So I promote it, or I wrote in the... Um, Gosh, the summer began writing in the, the summer of 2019, Aging Powerfully. And by the way, the, there's the beef, uh, a brief amount of um, uh, a memoir, but the book, the point of the book is to use this word powerfully as an acronym, 10 lifestyle modalities that you can adopt to give your life not only vibrant health, your body vibrant health but also your life um, balance and joy and um, the first five are actually the ones that we're going to focus on in terms of the um, these classes that I'm doing power p-o-w-e-r purpose others uh, whole food plant-based exercise and resilience and resilience covers sleep and stress management well two years after I wrote that book, I, uh, which was January 9th, two years after it was actually published by Amazon as an Amazon bestseller. I published, so it just happened a couple of weeks ago, the audio version of Aging Powerfully that just came out as well. I am doubling down on the message that I wrote two and a half years ago, published two years ago. And that is that lifestyle as medicine chosen well can make a, well, actually can give us decades and decades more in life. I'm 72. I wrote Aging Powerfully to set, celebrate my 70th birthday. One of the things that I promise in the book is that if we accept our past and take control of our future, again, using lifestyle as medicine, that we can find vibrant health, balance, and joy. And you're going to see sunflowers throughout because they are my well, soul flower. Something was written that I love. And the sunflower, it's an old French proverb, wherever life plants you, bloom with grace. I found a way to do that. So many of us have. And damn Helen Mirren wrote this about the sunflowers and again speaks to my heart i don't think there's anything on this planet that more trumpets life than a sunflower for me that's because of the reason behind its name not because it looks like the sun but because it follows the sun during the course of the day the head tracks the journey of the sun across the sky a satellite let me let somebody in a satellite dish for sunshine. Wherever light is, no matter how weak, these flowers will find it. That's such an admirable thing, such a lesson in life. I believe that. And so that's why you'll see many times in a lot of my motifs, a sunflower flower represented. And this is what I call aging powerfully. This woman in her 90s, possibly in her hundreds, is vibrant with an appreciation for life to the degree that she sees beauty and excellence and excitement in everything. Someday when I let that natural gray of my hair come out, I'm going to look just like her and revel in it. All right, lifestyle interventions. What are we talking about here? I've added a fifth one that isn't part of 
lifestyle medicine as at my uh, clinic, the one that I am a health coach with uh, covers, we've broken down lifestyle as medicine into four categories. And that yep. is nutrition, movement, community, and resilience. Resilience being uh, rejuvenation, rejuvenation being sleep and stress management. I've added to that purpose because I don't believe that we're going to make our, um, that we're going to, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting myself trying to let somebody in there, that we're going to pay much attention to our, mm, let's say, new directions or challenges that we can take on to better ourselves. We're not going to do it unless we have a reason why and a pretty strong reason why. Purpose. Ikigai is a word that the Okinawans use for purpose. Plan de vida is one that the Costa Ricans use, both of which are part of the blue zones. Book I have in my hand here, Dan Butner's Blue Zones, plays a, a role in not only a lot of what I direct in my book, but also what we can look at as a good example of life lived well by five specific communities. And they, the blue zones, by the way, are uh, uh, Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, the um, Nagoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, um, uh, Icaria, Greece, and 15 minutes from my house, Loma Linda in California. And they are the, the Seventh-day Adventist community of Loma Linda. And all of them have, for example, the Loma Linda group believes from their early, not only <laughs> spiritual teaching, but also their, um, the, the way they were told to live their lives um, by their, their religion. And that is that their body is a temple and deserves to be treated well. And that's part of their purpose to uh, appreciate what they were given in that way. All right, life purpose. How can we look at it and how can we, uh, let's say better define what it is from our lives. This is a good graphic to help you pull together your thoughts. What do you love doing? And what does the, the world need? Those two can lead to a mission. What does the world lead and what can you get paid for? That can lead to a vocation. What do you get paid for? And what are you really good at? What fires you up? That can be a profession. And then what are you good at? And what do you love to do? That's your passion. You put all of those together and right in the middle, you've, you can create a vision of what your purpose is, where you wanna go with it. I added some other thoughts that can be helpful with that as well. And they are in the form of questions. Um, how can you contribute and what can you offer? What would make you feel significant? What work would be meaningful to you, to your family, to others that you care about? Do you see something in your life or in the world that needs changing or that you can contribute to? Can you take personal responsibility to help bring that about that positive change? Who can you help and what can you do that may or will create lasting change. What bothers you? Oh, do you surround yourself and spend time with others who have purpose and uh, who are positive and are purpose driven? What bothers you about what bothers you about the world and in what way can you make a contribution? And if you were to die tomorrow, what would you want people to say at your funeral? That sounds dire and dark, but it's really not. As a matter of fact, there's a quote that I have in my book from an author that wrote about purpose in life. And that's one of the exercises 
she has people do. And that is, what would you want people to say about you when you're gone? Sometimes our purpose can be, I'll say, um, demonstrated by what we do that makes a difference to others. This group was practicing one morning in a park that I ride through uh, a couple of times a week when I'm on my, my hour cycle, uh, bicycling um, day. I call that a day. I call going up the mountain another day. And I have certain days for the things that uh, I do to move my body. And they were practicing, I asked them, they were practicing for a concert that they were going to do that was live to make a way or to, to as a way to raise funds for people in the neighborhood who are homeless. Uh, that's purpose. Okay, never doubt that a small group of people of committed people can change the world. It's the only thing that has. Margaret Mead said that. When somebody is lit up with purpose, others can feel your light and want to follow. And that's one of the things that I hope when I wrote Aging Powerfully in the back of the book, I state my mission. As a matter of fact, in the beginning of the book, when I dedicate the book, I wrote, I dedicate this to all who have known the feeling of being powerless, whether young and incapable of taking control or at any point in adulthood, when it becomes clear that there's a need for change. I wish for us, or my wish for us all, is to fully grasp that we have the power within us to alter the direction of our health and therefore our life. I dedicate this book and the rest of my life to taking command of what we can and aging powerfully. When you have that kind of a fire in any direction, those things that I outlined, all of which can fire up a person down to their soul, others can feel that. And we have power beyond what we think we have and to do what we think we can. Sometimes it has to do with our religion. Sometimes it has to do with simply accepting or acknowledging a greater power that we can work through that others can get energy from and take us anywhere we want to go. Aging Powerfully, as I said, became a mission for me when I wrote it. That's why I wrote it. And then because I knew as a health coach, I'm going on five years now as a health coach for Lifestyle Medical, a family practice that was founded by Dr. Wayne Dysinger, who is one of the founding members and past president of the College of Lifestyle Medicine. What I've seen there has, and it was about a year and a half into my being with them, actually two and a half years, what I've seen there is what gave me the, uh, I'll say the determination to put this down and encourage people to realize that they can, you can turn around intractable illnesses, the chronic illnesses of today, 75% of which, 80% of which are lifestyle related can be not only prevented, but treated or reversed with lifestyle rather than just medicine and procedures. And that's what I've learned. And that's what I had to say, you know, aging powerfully. Okay, movement, let's get to movement. I will give you examples of what movement can be. And Angela said something interesting. She said, I'm gonna use that word exercise. Some people worry about exercise because they think I've never gotten into it. I don't know if I can. Sometimes, and this is why we break it down into movement with lifestyle medicine. Sometimes what we do on a regular basis, and as Dan Buettner said about the blue zones, few of those people ever go to gyms or run marathons. They are doing movement in their everyday lives that keep their bodies strong and healthy. This person, Eileen Kupsoftis was interviewed as well 
by Chef AJ. And one of her dictates, because she's a physical therapist, she has a long string of credentials behind her name. She's a physical therapist who sees people in pain all the time and knows that as we get older, when things start hurting, we stop moving. And her way of teaching physical activity is to teach us in a way that treats us down to our core, strengthens our bones, strengthens our muscles, but not on an individual basis. She doesn't talk at all about resistance training. Well, she, that's not true, using weights, and she does, but she does it in a way to treat us from the fascia level down to the muscle level, then down to the bone level with movements that we don't see necessarily in a gym or we don't see in a lot of physical therapy offices. So this, um, the interview she had with Chef AJ, and you may want to note that reverse aging, uh, the fountain of, or reversing a, sorry, reverse aging, the fountain of youth. This is the interview that she gave that was sort of an overview of how she treats people and why she believes that we not should, but must exercise. I asked her if I could use some of the videos from her talk, and I'm going to be using those now um, because her evidence is irrefutable and she's already done the work of writing it out. So let's look at this. Why we must exercise. Physical activity has become the fourth leading risk factor for death globally, and that's from the World Health Organization. Number one is high blood pressure, meaning cardiovascular disease. Number two is tobacco use, well, by and large, in other words, pulmonary disease. And number three is high glucose, which is diabetes. Number four is simple lifestyle choices of inactivity. Diet alone is not enough, we must exercise. That's one of the reasons it's one of the pillars of health. We can eat an excellent diet and still not be strong and still not uh, extend our life. Oops. 6% of deaths globally result from physical activity, estimated 3.2 million preventable deaths a year. Again, the World Health Organization. Chain, all right, why must we exercise? And we'll just look at this because so many times the things that are, are, are uh, I'll say befuddling us. In other words, we have a joint pain. We're not thinking clearly. We can't sleep well. We're struggling with emotions and anxiety and depression. So many of those are from and can be well, not from a lack of activity, but can be ameliorated through activity, through movement. So it maintains good muscle to fat ratio. I'm actually gonna show you an, a, a, a cross section of a femur to show you what that really looks like. Mel metabolic rate increases, it improves digestion, energy, cholesterol levels down, improves sleep, increases muscle strength, strengthens bones. Some people believe that if they begin to see a decline on their DEXA scans, that the thing they have to do, and most doctors will tell you this, is start taking medications. Those medications have a lot of side effects. What we can do instead that can ameliorate that is we can start using our body to build muscle, to build bone, and we do that through either strength training or our own body weight, things like walking briskly or even running. That strike of our foot on the ground tells our bones, get going, strengthen yourselves. And we can strengthen our entire um, uh, bone and muscle system, again, by simply moving strengthens or reduces depression, lowers blood pressure, increases endurance, stamina, improves mental alertness, flexibility, self-esteem, positive attitude, 
immune system moves fluids through the lymph nodes. You know that our heart pumps blood. What moves our lymph uh, system and pushes out toxins? It's our muscles. It's the contraction of our muscles. So we have to move in order for the lymph system to move properly. Sweat glands removes toxins and waste and mobilizes the white blood cells. Sarcopenia, so uh, can we all, would you mind, because I don't have a chance to go through everything, would you just reach over and mute your, um, thank you. I was gonna say and mute your, your, yourself. All right, sarcopenia begins at 35 or beginning at 35. We lose about one to 2% of muscle mass a year but after age 60, that accelerates to 3% a year. In other words, in a decade, we could lose four to six pounds of muscle. And we will if we don't move, if we don't exercise. This is what I was referring to. Very dramatic. This is a healthy femur. In other words, our leg bone with muscle and a thin layer of fat around it, well, the fat ratio will change if we're not, sorry, if we're not moving. This is the kind of leg that, would, that you would struggle getting upstairs with. The fat has filled in where most of the muscle was. The muscles are weaker. And as we get older, some of us have a hard time understanding what it would be like to have a problem standing up from a chair, getting up from the bathroom, um, walking upstairs. I don't mean for lack of oxygen, but I mean for lack of strength. But as those things start shifting, those feelings start coming. And again, people stop moving. We can stop that whole process or reverse it by exercise. It's the fountain of youth. Studies report resistance exercises can reverse aging. Now remember, aging is something that's going to happen, sarcopenia, muscle loss. We can reverse that by 50% by moving our bodies. Over, um, oh, all right, check with your healthcare professional. This was funny, one of, well, I'll, I'll finish this. If you're over 30, if your body weight is, um, well, 130% or more of ideal family history of heart disease, uh, stroke, um, high blood pressure, current smoker. <laughs> uh, somebody was interviewing or Chef AJ was interviewing somebody, it may have been for this podcast with Eileen Cup's office. And AJ said, does anybody ever really do that? <laughs> and she replied, well, a lot of the problem is a lot of doctors are not involved in their own health care. Their diets aren't ideal. Their exercise regimes don't exist. And she said sometimes they deny the value and the power of what exercise can do, but they can. And that's why it's important to ask. They can evaluate the state of someone's health and understand if something should or should not be done. And so in that way, of course, that's valuable to do. All right, again, oh, strength training. And you're going to get sort of a formula of what these numbers look like as a base number, but strength training uh, at even the lowest level builds muscle, bone density, and weightlifters not only have the highest bone density, but they also have um, much greater bone strength. Part of the problem with the, the medications like Fosomax is that they may build bone density, but those bones aren't necessarily strong. As a matter of fact, they can be somewhat brittle. All right. All right. Most of us have heard that, that um, muscle is smaller, a pound of muscle is smaller than a pound of fat. And we've heard, well, if you're working out with weights, you could be, you could weigh more, but actually have more muscle, less fat. But a lot of people, and that's big, the difference between the two is about 15%. In other words, this, uh, my favorite 
way to heat these tortillas. And let me show you what tortillas I use. Uh -oh. I use an organic tortilla because I'm sensitive to gluten. I have everybody you. It's hard to find. I think that's me. Corn Thank tortillas you. that are also organic. That um, is me. I'm using my it's podcast, but it's supposed to be on right now. It's almost incredible. That's what I have. So, AJ, and I know, and I, uh, I thought about this, I'm worried about this because I thought, oh, this is going to be so frustrating for some people that can't see it. It says thin credibles that can't find. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody was probably scrambling like I would have been. Uh, okay. The important thing to know is not only that they are a difference in size, that we can look bulkier when we actually are uh, and way more because of, well, let me put it this way, look bulkier if we um, build up our muscle and it, it um, we don't do something in terms of body weight if we are very overweight because that muscle is going to fill in and the, the fat's still going to be there. And so be aware of that. But the important part is that it's possible to weigh more when we're actually leaner and healthier. But fat and muscle, both are met metabolically active. Fat will burn seven to 10 calories a day. Fat is less than a third of that. Um, but fat also releases um, inflammatory cytokines. In other words, there are the fat in our body is a metabolic machine and it sends out inflammatory elements that are um, that our body then has to um, try to um, process. And so for all of those reasons, anything we can do to build up our muscle, to reduce our fat, to get to a healthy weight, um, exercise helps with that, food is, what I consider to be the way you do that. And we talk about that next week. Um, it's worth doing. It's something that's important to adopt. Okay. And exercise increases the hippocampus. BDNF is brain derived neurotropic factor, which actually calms our mind, sharpens our thoughts, um, uh, helps relieve stress because it's, a, um, it's part of a healthy brain. And we can actually increase the effects of that by movement. All right, let's look at the basic recommendations. 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise is only 30 minutes a day. We'll look at ways that we can do that. An hour and 15 minutes a week if we are, um, uh, if it's vigorous exercise, and that can bro be broken off throughout the week. So 150 minutes a week, 30 minutes a day on an average, 75 minutes a week if it's vigorous. Strength training a couple of sessions a week, about 30 minutes a session. And flexibility training, a couple of sessions a week. Um, and let's look at what that looks like. Some people think, now this is kind of minimal gardening, but if you start a garden and you're digging, I was a landscape uh, uh, designer for 20 years and I did my own two and a quarter acre, acre garden, dug in most of the plants. I was in the best shape ever because I never stopped moving on those two acres. So in other words, gardening, even if it's in bed, if you're digging, you're lifting, you're bending, you're, um, you're planting, you're stretching, can be really good exercise. This is my husband, that's Tim. He's a CPA and a tax attorney, and yet he was a rock drummer for decades, even while he had his own practice. He'll go out and we have a soundproof area in the garage, he'll go out into his music room and pound away for a long time. That's exercise. It really builds up a sweat. Dancing, whether you take classes, whether you stand in your kitchen and go crazy when you hear your favorite song, whether you grab your favorite person and waltz around the floor or jitterbug or twist, that's all 
exercise that helps build flexibility, it helps you build coordination, and it builds strength with your legs. Golf, golf, tennis, what are some other games? Pickleball. Those are all great ways to exercise, and you can do those for an hour, an hour and a half a day. So it shows, or in a day, so it shows how these movements are a great way to kind of click off your determination to get at least your minimum. Let me tell you a little about what I do. I wake up every morning, and this is something that I want to recommend if you're going to adopt a plan, and that is that it's simply part of your calendar. If somebody says to me, Nan, let's do something at seven or eight, I'm unless it's something very unusual and a one-time thing, and that's pretty rare, I'm not going to be available because without thinking about it, I roll out of bed, I put on my workout outfit, and I'm out the door. I'm either running out the door for a run or I get in my car and go to the mountain for four, four and a half miles. When I was working toward, well, I'll talk about those later, toward longer runs. Um, again, then I had to put aside an hour, an hour and a half, even two hours for those runs. But even a jog around the block, if it's the first thing you do, not only is it good for your body, and your schedule because you know what you're going to do and you're just going to do it. You don't even question it, but it's also the best thing you can do for your circadian rhythm, which has a lot to do with your brain and your nervous system um, and your health. If you get out into the first morning light, because that light, as soon as you're outside in the light, sets something going with your pineal gland that releases melatonin about 13 hours later and the melatonin keeps building until you're sleepy enough to go to sleep. So first light, first exercise, if you can do it, it's a great idea. And then every evening, and it's either on my bike, it's either running or it's either going up the mountain near us, which just has paved paths, but I can either race, walk or run up and down. In the evening, every evening, we go for a half an hour walk because it's a great idea. And you can even break this up into, well, sections during the day. And that is, that walk is a great idea post-prandial, uh, prandial, post-prandial means after a meal um, because it helps you digest and it actually brings down your blood sugar as you walk. For every 10 minutes, your blood sugar comes down by a point or more. And so we do it for that reason. We do it because it kind of jiggles the bowels and kind of gets things going and settled. And because it gives us a half an hour to walk and talk rather than sit in front of TV. Here's an antidote. We got kind of hung up and we don't do these series because of exactly this. We got hung up with a show that somebody said, oh, you've got to watch this. And we did, and it was called um, Yellowstone. And we hadn't done these Netflix, what they call binge watching. And we started with one hour and then we'd watch maybe two. Then we'd watch three. One day we had four in a row. We never sit for four hours. Sitting is the new smoking, as they say. And we decided, you know what? We're doing what we're seeing people do when we take our evening walks. If you walk in the evening, in the winter, it's night. I mean, it's dark and you can see windows. And what do we see reflected in almost every window? The television. We'll be out there for a half an hour and nobody will be anywhere on the streets. And why? Because they're hung up with what they're watching on TV. Just a thought. Instead, we've gotten a half an hour. We've got movement. It helps settle us down for the night. We've gotten to talk. And we've just added a half an hour to our health. So that's that. Uh, tai Chi doesn't look like anything because it looks like there's no fierce action in these moves, but it's fabulous for coordination, for muscle strength, because those moves are held, not bulk muscle training, but for muscle strength and body shaping as well as mindfulness and the benefits of that. Yoga, 
and Pilates and class type movements, things that we can do recreationally with friends that get us to, again, stretch, concentrate, move, walk. That's me on the mountain. We were, um, Tim and I were walking and the cloud was all the way up to the top of the mountain. It was marvelous. It felt great to be out there. There weren't very many people out that morning because it was really, really cold. This is a group that I see, and this has a lot to do with community. We won't talk about community until the third week. Community is anybody in your life that recognizes you, that you recognize, and that connects with you. These people, because I walk all the time, I see either in a group or individually, this lady right here, the one in the middle, her name is Jane. She's now, Jane, are you 93 or 94? And she can walk up. There's an 800 foot elevation on this four mile path around the mountain. She walks up it every day. And why can she do that? How can she do that? Because she's never stopped. She's done it for years, for decades. And she's got this community that I believe between the exercise and her knowledge that if she didn't show up, a lot of people would be wondering where she was and a lot of dogs would be missing her because she carries in one of her pockets dog treats. <laughs> and it's funny to see her walk up to someone and immediately the dog is at her feet. Um, community, movement, mental and physical health. That's what we're talking about here. Riding, cycling. We were in Canada and one of the things Tim and I love to do is everywhere we go on vacation, we'll look for a bike shop and we'll look for trails. There's an app that you can download called All Trails to find trails in your neighborhood, anywhere you go that are marked trails. And we used that. And we were in, I believe we were just down from Banff, Canada. Uh, we were in Canada for a couple of weeks in several locations. Um, and there we were on our bikes. This was the first 10K run. And I wanted to mention that because somebody asked in one of my interviews how long I had been running. I began running at 70. In July, when I turned 70, which was, well, two years from now, or uh, two years ago, our, uh, our historic mission in, something that was built at the turn of the century in 1900, uh, went back to having races in person. And I love that. And it's a fundraiser for them. So I signed up for a 10K. 10K is 6.2 miles. I was never a runner. I may be kind of small, but I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it's half out of my mouth. I'm, I'm, I may be kind of small, but I have a big caboose. <laughs> and I always thought if you've got a big caboose, it's too hard to run <laughs> because there's all that jiggling back there. And so I never ran. God, I don't believe I said that. Anyway, I didn't. I wouldn't even run down the block. But I signed up for this 10K. And then I thought, oh, shoot. And I told the community. And then I thought, oh, shoot. I'm going to have to do this. And so I went to an app called Couch to 10K or Couch to 5K or Couch to Marathon. And I ran it. I ran the 10K and I was number, the first one was with the mission in and I was four in my age group. Then four months later, I ran it for another group and I was number two in my age group, mainly because there's hardly anybody in our age group that's still running. And this one, was a half marathon. I did a half marathon at the end of October, again, for the mission in this time, a half rather than 10 K. And this lady next to me did the same thing. And she's 77. This wow. is Helena. And she and her husband, she can easily run half marathons. She can easily run a marathon. I can't, I didn't easily do it. It was, it was really hard. Um, but I did it. This lady, Ernestine or Ernestine, um, Shepherd looks beautiful, doesn't she? Look at that body. You know how old she is? 83. How does an 83 year old look like that? Do you notice there's not a lot of softness anywhere? She's just all muscle. She has exercised. Now she chose to do this. She got energized by her daughter who said, Mom, 
you know, you could get really strong and decided to go to the gym. And so she goes to the gym for an hour or two on a regular basis. And I'm not saying I'm going to do that. I'm not saying you should, but look at the possibilities. This lady, Marge Jensen, when this picture was taken, I just took this picture out of a, um, a newspaper. She was in Loma Linda, so part of the Blue Zone, Seventh-day Adventist. At age 100, she wakes up every day. She takes a uh, one-mile walk. She gets on her stationary bike. She lifts weights. Those are probably five pounders, maybe seven. And she's lifting them. That's not easy to lift them straight out like that. And um, again, possibilities. Let's put you back over here. This man, Dr. Ellsworth Warham, again, Loma Linda, same magazine, same newspaper, was an open heart surgeon. He was doing open heart surgeries before other people were doing them and he was doing them internationally. He was the first one to try using the a simian heart, a baboon heart in surgery. So he was internationally known. He was vegan, became a vegan in midlife because he believed he was Seventh-day Adventist. So he was a vegetarian, but he became a vegan, meaning no animal protein at all, no animal product, no egg, no milk, no cheese, as well as no meat. Um, he lived to 104. He was still doing surgeries at 95, teaching surgeries to students at 95. And that's him in his 90s. Again, possibilities of what we can expect if we don't stop moving. So back to the pillars of lifestyle medicine, movement, uh, resilience, which is sleep and stress management, diet, and we'll talk about that next week, community, we talk about that on the third week. Movement is, again, our physical activity for our cardiovascular system, strength, flexibility, neurotherapy, the sunshine, remember that in your eyes, setting your circadian rhythm, giving you the feeling of energy, getting into fresh air. I think a lot of you are aware, and we'll talk more about this next week, about the, uh, the microbiome, three to five pounds of microbes. Some people say it's, a, it's like an organ in our, actually all over our body, but mainly in our gut. And with the American Gut Project, the, uh, originally thinking that the microbiome, not uh, that the gut, the colon was primarily just to get your fiber situated to go out. They realized that the fiber actually feeds those microbiota. Well, one and, and those microbiota release short chain fatty acids, which affect us throughout our entire body, our blood vessels, our heart, our eyes, our lungs. Um, our neuro uh, neurology in terms of our um, uh, the chemicals like serotonin, dopamine that actually set our, I'm going to say personality uh, in a way. Well, fresh air and especially nature, time in nature, and that can be in your own backyard um, with plants and the ground, that also feeds the microbiome. So being out exercising in nature can make, give you, that's like a trifecta. Um, and just activities in daily, uh, in daily life where you're not sitting. Again, sitting is the new smoking. I'm reading more and more about that and recommendations that every 30 minutes you get up and you move around in one way or another, even doing squats, even doing um, toe touches, even pushing up against the kitchen sink or a, a, a back against the kitchen sink counter, uh, doing body weight um, push-ups, anything you can do to move in between your sitting will make a huge difference uh, in terms of your health. Movement recommendations, again, 150 minutes a week, 75 if it's more vigorous, strength training, and flexibility training, smart goals. So you may be listening to this and thinking, oh man, I've got a lot to do. I don't know what I can manage. Consider 
thinking back to what I've said, watch the video again. It'll be up on YouTube. And my YouTube channel is Nan Simonson. So it's YouTube Nan Simonson. It works best if you write it the way you would my name with a space between Nan and Simonson. It just goes there better. I'm not sure why. Uh, in any case, SMART goals, apply these to what you've heard today that you're ready to adopt, that you're ready to improve, that you're ready to um, uh, accelerate. Be specific, make it measurable, be accountable. One of the great ways to be accountable is to tell other people. That was one of the smartest things I did. When I decided that I had a thing to say, that it was a mission, that I was going to address it as aging powerfully, and that I told others, I set up a accountability situation for myself that makes me feel like I must move toward that goal because I'm, I have too many people expecting that of me and I expect it of myself. Be sure it's measurable, make a chart. Be specific, know exactly what you're talking about doing. Okay, I'm gonna go to even 15 minutes a day until I can get to 30, until I can get to 45. Mine is an hour every morning, 30 minutes in the evening after dinner. Look at what you can do, put it down, measure it with tick offs on a calendar or on your phone, have an accountability partner. Between my husband and me, if one of us is feeling measly and, uh, you know, it's a little later, it's later than usual, or da da da, the other one will say, get your shoes on, let's go. And so we don't even try that trick <laughs> because no matter what, we both expect it of each other. Uh, make it realistically achievable. Uh, probably it wasn't a good idea to go from no running to 10K, 6.2 miles, but these other things were lined up ahead of time. And so that became achievable because everything else was set up and I had time to work toward it. And then include a timeline for completion so that you have a way of determining, well, this next week will be nutrition. The week following that will be, again, resilience and community. But on March 2nd, we can gather together again and share what it was that you learned from the experience of reevaluating, setting SMART goals, and putting into place something or everything that you heard today. Aging powerfully with the pillars, a reminder next week, the fall, oh, this, uh, yeah, next week, food and nutrition, the following week, sleep management, as well as community, and then our new meeting, same time, and that's the follow up and questions and answers. That's me saying, have a great time on Valentine's Day. And remember that you can do a lot of things to love yourself, and it doesn't have to be with a pound of candy. <laughs> And again, that's me 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 years from now saying, hey, have you given it a try yet? I hope you do.